Steve Rogers is beloved by all MCU fans, and recently, I've gotten more requests to do his life than anything else, so I decided to buckle down and tackle this monstrosity of a project. I went through every film he appeared in, all his appearances in comic books that are canon to the MCU, and did a bit more digging, especially for Endgame, to find out some things that the creators added that weren't in the films, which adds a lot to his story. Consider this an overview, recap, tribute, and deeper look at his character. This video holds major spoilers for the entire MCU, so there's your warning. Now that that's out of the way, let's get started. Steve Rogers was born in New York on July 4th, 1918 to Sarah and Joseph Rogers. While Sarah was pregnant with Steve, Joseph Rogers was confirmed to be killed in action during World War I, meaning that Steve never knew his father, but he always looked up to him for giving his life for their country. As a boy, Steve had a rough time health-wise. Not only was he extremely short and scrawny, but he also suffered from asthma, scarlet fever, high blood pressure, and heart trouble among other illnesses. On top of that, he was often attacked by bullies who made fun of his small size and many medical problems. A foolish Steve had too much bravery and pride for his own good, oftentimes standing up to the bullies and getting his ass kicked even more. One day when Steve was getting beaten up by a group of bullies, Bucky Barnes stepped in and beat the kids up. From then on, Bucky and Steve became best friends. Steve's mother got sick when he was young, but she fought against the illness for many years. One night when his mom was sick in bed, she told him that if he wanted to be a soldier like his father, he would have to fight for it due to his small size and the way the world looked at him. Steve's mother Sarah eventually lost her battle with her illness and died of tuberculosis. Steve made sure that she was buried next to her husband and his father. After the funeral, Bucky walked Steve to his house and offered to let Steve stay at his parents' place. But Steve declined, saying that he could get by on his own, which Bucky responded to saying that he didn't have to do it alone. Bucky then reassured his best friend that he'd always be there for him. I'm with you to the end of the line, pal. Steve and Bucky were inseparable and had a lot of fun together. Steve was always in Bucky's shadow, who was cooler, stronger, and taller, though Steve tried to make up for the size difference by stuffing newspapers in his shoes. During one of their trips together, they were forced to get a ride back towards Brooklyn on the back of a freezer truck as they had used all of their remaining money to buy hot dogs, while Bucky also managed to spend $3 as he attempted to win a stuffed bear for a girl named Dolores. Another time when they were at Coney Island together, Bucky convinced Steve to ride the Cyclone, resulting in Steve throwing up. Steve and Bucky went to art school in New York, Steve being a prodigy art student, and during an art class they took together, they were joking around about the model they were painting, but things took a serious turn when it was announced that America had joined World War II. After finding this out, Steve told Bucky that he wanted to join the army, but Bucky doubted him, saying that he got winded climbing three flights of stairs. However, Bucky agreed to train Steve to prepare him for his physical. Steve worked tirelessly, getting the shit kicked out of him in the boxing ring, and running for miles, trying to shave 10 seconds off his time like Bucky told him to. When it was finally time to enlist, Steve and Bucky went together, and when the doctor began to tell Steve no, Steve begged him, saying that he needed to do this. The doctor noticed that he had art training and told him to instead make posters to encourage people to enlist. When he walked out, Bucky, who had just been accepted to join the army, was there to greet him. And seeing the look on Steve's face, he told his friend he was sorry, only for Steve to walk off on his own. Steve continued to enlist at different enlistment offices under different names, but was rejected every time. Steve later took his frustration out on a guy in the cinema, only to get his ass kicked in the alley. He was once again saved by his friend, who after sending the guy running, told Steve that he was shipping out with the 107th the very next day. To cheer him up, Bucky took Steve to the Stark Expo on a double date, and there, Steve saw Howard Stark for the first time. During the night, Steve and Bucky got into an argument about Steve joining the army, and they were overheard by Abraham Erskine. Steve said bye to his friend, assuring him that he would be there with him soon. Bucky told him not to do anything stupid, and Steve responded saying, How can I? Taking all the stupid with you. Abraham Erskine overhearing this conversation made him seek Steve out and offered him a chance, accepting his enlistment form. Steve was introduced to Peggy Carter, the agent in charge of that division. Despite being the smallest one there, Steve impressed everyone with his quick thinking and his selfless nature. Is this the test? Because of this, he was chosen to get the Super Soldier Serum. He worked with Erskine and Howard Stark, and he became superhuman. How'd you feel? It's all right. 
He went from being 5'4 and 95 pounds to 6'2 and weighing 240 pounds of pure muscle. Right after the successful experiment, however, Erskine was shot and killed. And using the super serum, Steve went after the killer on foot while he drove a car. He then dove underwater to stop a submarine and threw the killer out of the water. An incredible feat that shocked Steve at what he could do. Before he could find out who the killer was, however, the man killed himself, his last words being, Hail Hydra! With Erskine now dead, any hope of reproducing the super soldier serum was lost, making Steve the only one to have it. Steve was excited to finally serve his country, but after stopping the Hydra agent, the public took notice, and instead of sending him into battle, they made him a performer dubbed Captain America. He toured the country to encourage more people to enlist, and he became a star. Though he was very good at it, this was not what Steve wanted. Peggy Carter told him that he was meant for much more, and reminded him why Erskine had chosen him. Steve then found out that the 107th had taken a huge loss, and knowing that that was Bucky's unit, Steve went by himself to save Bucky and the other 300 men that were presumed dead. Steve found and freed them, and later found Bucky tied down after being experimented on. They escaped from Red Skull, and Steve led the men back to base, a hero through and through. Let's hear it for Captain America! Seeing Captain America's true potential, they started putting him on the front lines, leading many battles and winning them all. Howard Stark gave him a shield made of vibranium, a rare and almost indestructible metal. Steve and Howard Stark worked together very closely, and Steve was highly regarded in Howard's eyes. Steve also became close to Peggy Carter, and the two quickly started to fall in love. They both knew that that was not the time nor place, however, as they were at war, but Peggy did say to Steve that they should go dancing. During one mission that went terribly wrong, Bucky fell to his death when Steve failed to save him. Something that broke Steve's heart. Later on, Steve learned what Red Skull planned to do with the Tesseract, and he attacked Hydra's base to put a stop to it. Peggy Carter helped him get onto Red Skull's ship, and before he left, he kissed her. He successfully stopped Red Skull, who was sucked up by the Tesseract's power, but Steve had no way of stopping the ship that was on its way to kill all of New York. While in the ship, he talked to Peggy and told her that he had to sacrifice himself and put it in the water. He told her he needed a rain check on their dance, and Peggy gave him the time and place to meet him. A week next Saturday at the Stork Club. Eight o'clock on the dock, don't you dare be late. Steve lowered the ship and crashed into the water. Everyone thought Captain America was dead, and he was mourned by the nation, remembered in history as a hero. One blood sample of Captain America remained, and it was kept by Howard Stark, and he wanted to use it in the hope that he could develop something useful from it. You know, I believe that sample SR-53, that blood, Captain America's blood, holds the key to vaccines, medications, possibly even the cure for the common cold. But Peggy Carter confiscated the blood sample and got rid of it, pouring it off the Brooklyn Bridge, crying as she did so. Cap left an impression on millions of people as the first ever superhero, and left an even bigger impression on Howard Stark, who said that Captain America was his greatest accomplishment, though that changed when he had his son Tony. Peggy Carter went on to marry a man and have children, which I'll address later on in the video. Steve did not die, however. He was trapped in ice for nearly seven decades and was found in present day. When he woke up, he wasn't worried about being gone for 70 years or the fact that he did not die. All he cared about was Peggy. You gonna be okay? Yeah, yeah, I just, I had a date. Steve found himself lost in a world that had moved on without him, and he found it very difficult to adjust to his new surroundings. He spent a few weeks in seclusion at one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s safe houses, and later moved into an apartment in New York. While there, he looked through some files of his old friends from the 1940s, and he eventually found a file on Peggy Carter, which said that she was still alive. He visited her fairly often at her retirement home, and was very happy to have her back in his life, though it was not the same as it was. He continued his artistic skill, and sat outside at a restaurant, drawing a building in New York, and he realized that he still had his artistic skill, even after all these years. When the waitress told him that there was free wireless, an oblivious Steve asked if it was wireless radio. He eventually made his way to a boxing gym, where he was approached by Nick Fury once again, this time recruiting him for a mission to assemble the Avengers. On his way to S.H.I.E.L.D., Phil Coulson debriefed him on the mission, and told him about Bruce Banner, a man who tried to recreate Erskine's super soldier serum that gave Cap his abilities. But for Banner, it went wrong, and exposed him to high levels of gamma radiation, and in turn, transformed him into the Hulk. They told Steve that he would lead the Avengers to stop Loki, and they presented him with a uniform that was very reminiscent of the original costume back in the 
1940s. Steve along with Tony butted heads at first, seeing as all Tony's father, Howard Stark, did was talk about how great Captain America was during Tony's childhood, which made him resentful to his new Stars and Stripes leader. They worked together, however, to bring Loki in, and while doing so, they met Loki's stepbrother, Thor. When the entire team minus Hawkeye was together, Cap, Iron Man, Banner, Black Widow, and Thor all began to argue, specifically Steve and Tony. You know, you may not be a threat, but you better stop pretending to be a hero. A hero? Like you? You're a laboratory experiment, Rogers. Everything special about you came out of a bottle. When the ship came under attack, however, Steve and Tony put their differences behind and protected each other as they fixed the ship. In the chaos, Steve and the others were very sad to hear about the death of Phil Coulson, but his death ended up bringing the heroes together. Cap participated in and led the Avengers in the Battle of New York, and together they captured Loki and destroyed the Chitauri army. After the battle, the Avengers parted ways and Steve moved to Washington, D.C. Steve was still adjusting to the 21st century, and during his time with S.H.I.E.L.D., he was trained in both parkour and modern forms of combat to make him even more effective in the field. He later worked with Black Widow or Natasha Romanoff to make sure that the weapon called Zodiac did not fall into enemy hands. Together, they successfully stopped them, Cap ending the mission by jumping out a window to catch the man with the weapon, successfully retrieving it and making it back to Black Widow. Steve and Natasha took a trip to New York where Steve used to live, and he showed her around excitedly, but when they realized they were being followed, they changed and ambushed their pursuers. They were then attacked by more people using an ambulance as cover, and Steve and Natasha stopped them and took the ambulance for themselves. Cap found their base of operations and easily took them down with the help of Black Widow. However, the people they were after filled the streets with smoke as they went after a Nobel Prize winning professor. Only having one gas mask, Cap used it and jumped down to rescue her. He tracked her down, finding her with a gun held to her head, and when the professor stomped on the kidnapper's foot, Cap used that opportunity to knock him out with the shield and save her. While in DC, Steve met Sam Wilson, passing him every day on his run, saying, On your left. On your left. Uh-huh, on my left. Got it. Don't say it! Don't you say on it! Your left. Come on! He then went on another mission with Black Widow, but this time he was very mad when he discovered that Romanoff was hacking into the ship's computer, sent on her own mission by Fury without Cap's knowledge. Because of this, they also let their target get away, which he blamed Romanoff for. Steve later voiced his annoyance to Fury when they met after their mission. This isn't freedom. This is fear. When Fury told Cap to join the program, he refused, not liking the ideals Fury showed. Steve went to a museum dedicated to him, and there he went down memory lane seeing Bucky, and later seeing Peggy discuss his heroics when he saved all those men from Red Skull, including one of them that was her husband, which again, I'll touch on later in the video. This inspired Steve to visit Peggy in her retirement home, but every time he saw her, it was getting harder and harder, as she had short-term memory loss, forgetting that she had seen Steve before. Your life, Cap, has been so long. Well, I couldn't leave my best girl. Now it shows me a dance. Fury was later shot while in Steve's apartment, and Steve went after the killer, and to his shock, the killer caught his shield with his metal arm. A stunned Steve wondered who he was, and Romanoff later told him about the Winter Soldier. He's credited with over two dozen assassinations in the last 50 years. They also witnessed what looked like Fury dying right in front of them, which left them pretty shaken up. Steve was later attacked by a group of members who turned out to be part of Hydra, and though he took them all down, he was forced to go on the run with Romanoff. They narrowly avoided agents by kissing each other in the mall, which Romanoff later gave Steve a hard time for. Was that your first kiss since 1945? The two then went to Camp Lehigh, the same camp where Steve was brought when chosen by Erskine. While there, they discovered that Hydra had not gone away like they thought, but had been growing for years, and they narrowly escaped the building being blown up. Desperate, they went to Sam Wilson, and the three worked together to get information out of Agent Sitwell. They were then approached by the Winter Soldier, and a fight broke out. As Steve was fighting him one-on-one, -on -one, he managed to get the Winter Soldier's mask off, and to his complete and utter shock, it was his old friend Bucky. Bucky? Steve was shaken to his core, and therefore gave himself up without a fight. He was sure he had watched his friend die, falling from the train on that awful day. He blamed himself, and none of this made any sense at all. This changed his whole mission, now desperate to save his friend rather than kill the Winter Soldier. They all found out that Fury was still alive, and they went on a mission to stop Hydra from wiping out anyone deemed as a threat to them. Steve ended up going after Bucky, and as the two fought, Steve let himself get taken down, refusing to hurt his friend. He then said something that snapped Bucky out of it. Then finish it, because I'm with you to the end of the line. The same line that Bucky had said to Steve after his mom's funeral. 
I'm with you to the end of the line, pal. They both fell from the ship and went into the water, and Bucky, who was now partially snapped out of it, saved Steve's life and left him there. Steve woke up in the hospital next to Sam, and being grateful to his friend, he said, On your left. Steve and Sam went on a mission to find and save Bucky, Steve hoping to convince Bucky of who he really was. While on the mission, however, he was called by Jarvis to help stop a Hydra threat, and the Avengers reassembled. Together, they stopped their army, and the team was back together again. The team later had another mission, this time going after a Hydra base. They eventually stopped them and got Loki's scepter, and after the mission, they returned to Stark Tower, now dubbed Avengers Tower. During a dinner party, Thor let everyone see if they were worthy of picking up his hammer, and Thor got a bit scared when Steve made it move a bit. Recently, the Russo brothers, the directors and part writers of The Winter Soldier, Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame, said that Captain America could always pick up the hammer, and in this scene, he realized this, but did not pick it up all the way because he did not want to embarrass Thor. During the dinner party, they were attacked by Ultron, who escaped into the internet after the Avengers stopped him. When they went after Ultron, they were met by Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, and Scarlet Witch put almost all of the Avengers into a trance. And for Steve, he saw a vision of meeting Peggy for the dance that he missed, but then as he turned around, he was all alone once again. After the Hulk destroyed a city, the Avengers had to go into hiding at Clint's house, and there Steve and Tony got into a bit of an argument. Isn't that the why we fight so we can end the fight so we get to go home? Every time someone tries to win a war before it starts, innocent people die. They eventually went after Ultron, this time focusing on the indestructible body that Ultron planned on putting himself in. They successfully got it and put Jarvis into it to create Vision. Cap once again led the team, this time in Sokovia, which was floating in the air getting ready to be dropped. Together, they got everyone out before destroying the city, ensuring that it would not hit the ground, which would end up killing millions. They stopped Ultron and once again won the fight. Cap stayed at the new Avengers facility, and there he began to train the new recruits to the team, War Machine, Vision, Falcon, and Scarlet Witch. He also trained a great deal with Romanoff, who was also a big help in training the new recruits. After the battle in Sokovia was won, Hydra still managed to get their hands on Ultron sentry parts, and they used them to construct Ultimo, a giant robot. They set it loose on a small village, and Cap, Romanoff, and the new recruits want to put a stop to it. Cap told them to assemble, and led his team to victory in the battle. This same team later had another mission, but this time it led to disaster, when Scarlet Witch was unable to contain an explosion, killing hundreds of people. This led to the Sokovia Accords, essentially making the government have power over the Avengers. An upset Cap refused to do this, and his day got even worse when he got the very sad news that Peggy Carter had died. He went to her funeral very heartbroken, and there he found out that the girl he thought to be Kate was actually Peggy Carter's great niece, who later on, Steve would have a romantic moment with. After the funeral, a very sad Steve was comforted by Romanoff as he cried on her shoulder. Steve later came to the rescue of Bucky after he was accused of a bombing, and it led to a chase between the two of them and Black Panther, resulting in all of them being taken in. While there, Bucky was put back into his Winter Soldier programming, and after he caused a lot of damage, Steve rescued him from the water the same way Bucky rescued him from the water two years before this. Steve was thrilled when Bucky proved he was himself again, and Steve finally got his old friend back. Cap eventually recruited a group of the Avengers to his side, fighting against Tony and the Accords. This led to an all-out war between the Avengers, and Cap and Bucky ended up escaping, but at a price, as the rest of their team was taken into custody and locked up. The two were later approached by Tony, and when Tony found out that Bucky had killed his parents, the three began to fight, holding nothing back. Bucky got hurt badly, getting his metal arm blown off, but Steve beat Tony. As he left, Tony told Steve that his shield did not belong to him and that he did not deserve it as Tony's father had made it. Steve dropped the shield and left holding a very injured Bucky. When they got outside the facility, they were met by Black Panther who told them not to worry as he now knew the truth and he apologized to Bucky for going after him. He then told the two of them that he might know someone in Wakanda who could get rid of Bucky's Hydra programming. Before going to Wakanda, however, Bucky and Steve flew to the prison where the rest of their team had been locked up. Bucky took the wheel as Cap jumped down to the water and swam to the facility. He made his way through the guards single-handedly and freed the rest of his team. Steve and Bucky then went to Wakanda, and Steve left his friend there so they could fix his mind. 
Steve wrote Tony a letter, along with giving him a phone, saying that if he needed him, he was just a call away. With the Avengers split up, Steve, Sam, and Natasha went off on their own, ensuring the Chitauri parts that were floating around the black market were confiscated before they got into the wrong hands. Eventually, they were approached by Nick Fury, who talked to Cap. He tried to convince him to make amends with Tony, but Steve refused, saying that he gave Tony a way to reach him, referring to the phone that he had sent him. Once Bucky was out of the cryo-freeze, Steve sometimes came to Wakanda to see his old friend. Steve, Sam, and Natasha eventually went to save Vision from Thanos' Black Order and successfully drove them off. They reunited with War Machine, and the group had a discussion about what to do with Vision and the Mind Stone in his head now that Thanos was after the Infinity Stones. Vision said that they should sacrifice him and destroy the stone in his head, but Wanda refused to do this. While watching the two have this conversation, Steve looked at them with extreme sorrow, recognizing how similar this was to him talking to Peggy before he put the ship in the water. This made Steve say that they were not destroying it or risking Vision's life. Life, which was him ensuring that Vision and Wanda stayed together even if he and Peggy could not. We don't trade lives, Vision. Captain, 70 years ago, you laid down your life to save how many millions of people? Tell me, why is this any different? Because you might have a choice. They realized that they did have a choice, and they took Vision to Wakanda. There, Thanos' army came, and an all-out battle started. They fought the army off while Shuri tried to get the stone out of Vision. Ultimately, however, it was futile. When Thanos showed up, Steve and the others tried to stop him, but to no prevail. Thanos got the stone and wiped out half the universe, including half of the Avengers. Steve was devastated, as his two best friends, Bucky and Sam, floated away into dust. Steve and the remaining Avengers stayed at their facility looking for Thanos, but found nothing. While at the facility, they had acquired an old beeper found next to where Fury had died. Steve, along with Natasha, Banner, and Rhodey were in the facility when it turned off, and moments later, Captain Marvel approached them, asking where Fury was. They told her what had happened, and Captain Marvel went into space to save Tony and Nebula. When she returned, Steve and Tony met for the first time since their fight in Civil War. Tony got angry at Steve and referred to a conversation that they had when Ultron came. How are you guys planning on beating them? Together. I said we'd lose. We'll lose. You said... And we'll do that together too. We'll do that together too. And guess what, Cap? We lost. He then told Steve that he needed him, and he wasn't there. The team eventually found where Thanos was, and they all went there, desperate to get the stones back to reverse what he had done. To Steve and everyone else's utter horror, they found out that Thanos had destroyed the stones, which made an angry Thor kill Thanos once and for all. For five years, the world was sad and depressing after losing half of its life. Steve helped people by having support groups for those who had lost loved ones and friends. When Ant-Man returned, the team found a way to time travel, meaning they could get the stones in the past and bring everyone back. They went to recruit Tony, knowing that he was the only one who could figure it out, but Tony refused, not wanting to give up his family. Tony eventually came around, however, and brought Cap his shield, which he had dropped during their fight seven years earlier. Thank you, Tony. They brought the remaining Avengers back together, and they all went to the past. This is the fight of our lives, and we're gonna win. Whatever it takes. Steve, along with Tony, Banner, and Lang, went to 2012 during the Battle of New York. They watched their past selves give the scepter to who they thought were shield agents, but were really Hydra. Steve met them on the elevator and secured the scepter using the information he had from the future. Hail Hydra. As he was leaving, however, he met his past self and had to fight him. With a lot of difficulty, he beat his past self and secured the scepter, but Tony and Lang failed to get the Tesseract. However, Steve and Tony realized that there was another way to get the Space Stone. You trust me? I do. They went back even further in time to 1970 at Camp Lehigh. They successfully got the Tesseract and got more pin particles to time travel. While there, Steve ended up in Peggy's office. He saw that she had a picture of him framed on her desk, which meant a lot to him. His heart then sank when he saw Peggy on the other side of the glass, and all his feelings for her came rushing back. For a minute, he forgot about the mission. He forgot about everything and everybody but her. It took everything in him not to shout through the glass and hold her one more time, but he knew that that was not an option. This, however, sparked an idea in Steve's mind. When they returned to the present, Steve was ecstatic that they got all of the stones, but was horrified and heartbroken to find out that Natasha did not make it back. Do we know if she had family? Yeah. Us. The Avengers had Hulk use the stones, and they brought everybody that Thanos had made disappear come back. This was not the end, however, as Nebula brought the Thanos from the past to the present, and he destroyed Avengers Tower. Cap, Iron Man, and Thor all went after him, and when Iron Man was knocked out, and Thor was pinned down by Thanos, Cap called Thor's hammer Mjolnir to him. I knew it. 
After Thanos knocked Thor out, Cap fought him one-on-one -on -one using both his shield and the hammer. He put up a good fight, better than anyone else ever had against the Mad Titan, but eventually Thanos beat him, destroying his shield. Cap got up again though, knowing that he could do this all day, but this time he faced Thanos and his entire army, and just when he thought hope was lost, he heard his fallen friend say the line that bonded them since the first day they met. On your left. Cap was joined by every Avenger, ally, and friend they had, and Cap led them all, saying, Avengers! Assemble. No! It was an all-out epic battle, unrivaled by any. Thor and Cap worked together, now both being worthy, and they switched weapons. No, no, give me that. You have the little one. At the end of the battle, Cap and Thor worked together and held Thanos down, but he defeated both of them, temporarily knocking Cap out. While he was knocked out, Tony secured the stones before Thanos could snap his fingers, and he used them to defeat Thanos and his army once and for all. The fight was finally over. It came at a price, however, as Tony's body was not strong enough to handle that kind of power. Steve looked on, devastated, as he watched Tony die, surrounded by his friends and loved ones. While he might have had his differences with Tony, he always respected him, and he knew that the world lost a great man that day. Steve attended Tony's funeral, and he was front and center as he paid respect to his friend. The mission was not over, however. They still had to return the stones in time, and Steve volunteered for this task. Sam offered to go with him, but Steve had his own plan in mind that he had thought of while he was in 1970. He told Sam that he was a good man, but that he had to do this by himself. He then said goodbye to his oldest friend, and the two had the same exchange they had before Bucky left for the war 80 years before that. Don't do anything stupid till I get back. How can I? You're taking all this stupid with you. Steve put all the stones back where they had gotten them, one of which led him to see Red Skull again, and the two had an exchange for the first time since World War II. He did not come back to the present, however. He instead went to the time and place that Peggy had told him to meet her for their dance. Steve lived out the rest of his life, a happy man with the woman he loved. The creators for Winter Soldier and Endgame confirmed that Peggy's kids were always Steve's. The kids and the fact that Peggy married someone was revealed in the Winter Soldier, and it was quite clear that when Steve visited the old Peggy, the father was not seen in the pictures, and this was because Steve was the father all along. The creators restated what Hulk said, what happened in the past has already happened. If you go back to the past, you simply created a new reality. So this basically means that Steve going back did not change anything, because Steve had always gone back. It had no effect on the 22 films in the MCU before this. There are some butting heads on this topic, however, between the writers and directors, but I think the original idea that Steve was always the father is more widely accepted than anything else, especially because it follows the rules of time travel established in the film more so than anything else. The creators went on to say that Steve helped his Captain America when needed, but after marrying Peggy, he retired. Going further into what the Russo brothers said, the Steve who showed up in 2023 would not have lived that long, but they confirmed that he used Pym Particles and the Quantum Suit to go to that specific time. They elaborated, saying that while there, he changed out of the Quantum Suit and waited for Sam to come over. When Sam approached him, Old Man Steve gave him the shield, passing the torch of Captain America on to his good friend and ally. After that, he then went back to where he had come from before coming to 2023 to live out his final years with Peggy and his family, and presumably, he died before Peggy. Which makes sense because he aged 12 years while with the Avengers. So when he went back, he was presumably 12 years older than Peggy. Steve was put through so much, and always put other people and the world before himself. It was well earned for him to finally have the life he dreamed of with the only woman he ever loved. In his lifetime, he accomplished so much. He was a leading force in World War II, joined and led the Avengers, stopped countless world-ending threats, saved 50% of the universe from being wiped out, and after all of that, finally got to live a quiet family life where he was able to die in retirement and peace. He was an inspiration to so many people, and will forever be remembered as one of the best superheroes of all time. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and see more of this little dude. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook for Movie Flame updates. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured in the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you press that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great videos on the way.